Ladies and gentlemen, could I have your attention, please? Good morning. Thank you. Thank you. I can tell by the buzz in the audience that everyone is still enjoying themselves and reviewing, rehearsing, and discussing the tremendous intellectual meals that we've had, or meals of intellectual content that we've had for the last two days. We've got another uh, almost a full day today, ending up with Lord Christopher Monckton, who undoubtedly will have us all standing up and cheering no matter how tired we are. I've got uh, just one item of, uh, of housekeeping. There are two book signings that'll be occurred, uh, that will be held later this morning. Uh, Nils Axel Morner will be signing his book at 845 on the fifth floor in the uh, exhibition area. And at 1035, Chris Horner will be signing his book. I'm sure you'll enjoy that. We've got two keynoters this morning. We'll start with Jay Lear. Jay is the science his, Jay's science-related achievements um, are, are quite extensive here at, at Heartland. They're lengthy and deep. After graduating from Princeton University at age 20 with a degree in geological engineering, Jay went on to Princeton and earned a PhD. Uh, G, Jay went on to receive the nation's first PhD in groundwater hydrology from the University of Arizona. Dr. Lear is the author of over 1,000 magazine articles and journal publication, in journal publications and 29 books, all of them still in print. He's a fearsome foe of junk science and a happy and enthusiastic missionary of sound science, free markets, and fair play. <clears throat> As for the future, Jay already is in training for the 2011 Iron, Ironman Triathlon in Florida when he'll be 75 years old. That will give Jay an even dozen finishes in this most grueling of road races. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the science director of the Heartland Institute, Jay Lair. Good morning and thank you, Dan. It uh, is an honor and a pleasure to uh, be here this morning on this uh, last day of our fourth uh, exceptionally outstanding conference on climate change, and uh, we have accomplished here so much. I joined, began working with Heartland in 1993 following uh, the publication of a book I wrote called Rational Readings on Environmental Science, which exposed uh, the many uh, alarmist issues that were developing within uh, environmental uh, science, and I became, uh, for a short time, I preceded uh, James Taylor as editor of Environment and Climate News and then became a science director. And I think when I uh, joined the staff, we had nine. I think Joe has said we're up to uh, 37 uh, now, which certainly is an indication of our success. But all of you here have been part of this success. And while for uh, this three-day meeting, we're constantly uh, decrying the misinformation that is put out by our opposition, uh, our success and what we've achieved has been uh, truly amazing. And uh, if it would be appropriate, uh, Mark Morano came up with an idea for me last night that we should all toast the success that we have achieved thus far uh, and then begin the, the next uh, journey to even higher ground in convincing the public that uh, global warming is not a crisis and that we should not destroy the world's economy as a result of it. So I'd like you to do that. Lift your orange juice and congratulate all of us for what we have achieved. Uh, it really is, uh, is amazing. I hope uh, as much as this audience uh, and, and within this audience, we have uh, achieved so very much that I'm, I'm going to implore you and hope to motivate you toward the end of my talk uh, to do even, uh, even more uh, to convince the 80% of the public that is not uh, passionate, emotionally, or religiously involved in the climate change issue uh, of what is going on. We're not quite there where we have the critical mass of the public on our side that will ultimately turn the media to stop feeding them the lies and the misinformation. And I'm I have a small way of helping you to do that, and I'm, I'm very persuasive. Uh, 
Dan mentioned some of my athletic uh, uh, prowess, and uh, I think my greatest achievements are in motivating uh, others, as I hope to do for you today. Uh, my wife of 20 years is sitting in the audience, and uh, I had quite a reputation as an Ironman when uh, I asked her to marry me, and she mistakenly said yes. But before she said yes, she waved her uh, finger at me, and she said, uh, now get this straight, I will never run a marathon or ride a bike uh, 200 miles on a weekend as I normally did. And uh, a month ago, she ran her third uh, Boston Marathon, uh, came in in the top 20% top in her age group. She's now ranked eighth in the world in combined running and cycling uh, events. So uh, get ready for the fact that at the end of my talk, I'm going to convince you to do some things that are uh, almost as equally as heroic. You have before you uh, a copy of my paper. I decided it was useful to explain the history of, uh, of science in the last 60 years, which brought us to a position where uh, the public is prone to accept uh, misinformation where the scientists are prone uh, to hide their, their science and manipulate uh, data, as we know from the emails from East Anglia University and, and all the other aspects of the climate gate uh, scandal. It's not a surprise that we're in a position that this could happen. So I'm going to tell you the, the, uh, a little bit of the history. It's all in detail in my paper. I'm going to then uh, explain to you what you already know of the incredibly low level of scientific understanding that the public uh, has with regard to science that makes them an easy target for misinformation. And then I am going to uh, implore you to do even a little bit more than you do, and that relates to why you have uh, on each of your napkins when you walked in a copy of my uh, professional card. The importance of the card uh, is not the side with my name on it, but uh, what I wrote on the back of it. And we'll talk about that in my, uh, in my con conclusion. Um, the, the problem of science goes back to World War II. In World War II, we, in the United States, and in many other countries involved in the war, we gathered together uh, as a unit uh, to battle evil, and we set out in this country to bring our best scientists together to develop the atomic bomb, which ended World War II. Uh, unfortunately, the, the people that guided that mission felt that it was so successful that all scientific endeavors could be managed by government. And we went from a position of uh, private research to government research almost overnight. The National Science Foundation was formed. The National Institute of Health was formed. And it was the beginning of uh, what is called a prestige system in science, and I think it was uh, alluded to by uh, others before me, Harrison Schmidt and, and uh, Patrick Michaels, and even Steve McIntyre, the way we uh, decide what science should be done. So the government uh, began to pour in tens of billions of dollars into uh, research through the National Science Foundation, and they in every area of science, they brought together the most prestigious scientists in each field uh, who began turning, and I think it was Pat Michaels that coined the term, and I'm going to use it from now on. They, they moved the peer review process to the PAL review process. Un unless you were uh, following uh, the line of thinking of the prestige panel, uh, your chances of having a grant uh, qualify for funding became very small. Now, with the large amount of money, it came a huge influx of requests for that money. There were so many 
proposals uh, coming into the government for funding in the, in the 60s and 70s that these prestige panels themselves could not keep up with analyzing them. They could not look at the body of work that the scientists that were coming for a grant would put together in their proposals. So they really stopped looking at the quality of the, the scientists' work, and instead they looked at the quantity of the work. And so that was the beginning of the movement from where we, we actually did cause and effect experimentation, and we moved to using statistics. And, and it was there that the whole, the whole modeling idea, using mathematical models and numbers to make a case rather than true experimentation. And this, this volume of, of work that was required to get a grant really launched what you all know today as the publish or perish system. Uh, that term uh, was only coined uh, in the 50s, and the pressure on academicians uh, to publish is, uh, is only uh, a little less than 60 years old. It does not go back before World War II. And what it sadly brought in, worst of all, is the concept of consensus in science. Many of you uh, remember Michael Crichton's great book, State of Fear. Uh, Michael made some fabulous uh, scientific speeches around the country. And in one of them he gave at Caltech uh, Institute, he said that consensus is the, uh, the last refuge of the rogue scientist. And it really is true. And, and today, the public not schooled in science is uh, asked to believe that if a lot of people uh, believe something, it must be true, and they no longer deal with evidence. But actually, the consensus problem that we are battling today, I mean, it is really this whole overturning of consensus that we are involved in, and, and in fact, it, it doesn't matter that there may be more of us than there are of them if people came forward and were willing to actually raise their hand and say, uh, I don't believe that man uh, is responsible for the, the climate of the earth. That wouldn't make our case any better uh, than theirs, which they try to make by consensus. But it's been around forever. Uh, it may surprise you that back in the middle of the 19th century, around 1850, uh, doctors did not understand that germs cause disease. Uh, doctors would move uh, from the, uh, the, the, the morgue part of a hospital into the birthing room of the hospital, and infant deaths were uh, very, very high. A, a fellow by the name of Ignaz Semmelweis around uh, 1850 uh, first discovered the germ idea and implored doctors to wash their hands and sanitize their instruments. He was followed by Louis Pasteur, Joseph uh, Lister, Oliver Wendell Holmes, supporting the germ theory, but as great as these scientists were, it took over a half a century to get doctors to wash their hands in hospitals. In 1912, Alfred Wegener looked at a map, as you might have done as a child, and said, gee, I think all those continents look like they fit together in one big landmass. And he predicted the movement, continental drift of the continents uh, separated. Well, when I was uh, at Princeton in 1953 studying geological engineering, if I had raised my hand and said to my professor that I think uh, the continents were one one landmass, I'd probably have been flunked and drummed out of school because nobody accepted Wegener's proposal in 1912. It wasn't until the 1960s that continental drift was, uh, was accepted. Uh, all of you grew up at a time when you thought if you got an ulcer, it was because you had a type A personality. Uh, two scientists in Australia in 1982, Barry Marshall uh, and uh, another fellow, can't remember his name, uh, okay, uh, they proposed that there was a, a bacteria or virus, the H. pylori, that had to be present in order for an ulcer to form. They received the Nobel Prize 
In 2006, it took 24 years, really, for their phenomenal development to be recognized. So consensus has been with us for a long time, and it has no place in science at all. Albert Einstein, uh, one of his very many famous quotes, uh, said that about his theory of relativity that there, there are no number of scientists that would come to my side and, and tell me how great my theory was, it, it would make it no better or no more right, no, no matter how many people. And, but it would only take one scientist to disprove me through trial and error, cause and effect, and experimentation. And that is what we have to move to, to make science evidence. The next area of the history that really brought us down, and, and this is sad, it was mentioned by one of the speakers uh, in the last two days, uh, is the very sad and unfortunate book that Rachel Carson wrote, Silent Spring. Uh, Silent Spring has played a, a terrible role in, uh, in science throughout the world uh, because while Rachel Carson might have been a, a well-meaning uh, marine biologist, she wrote a book which doesn't have a single page uh, without colossal technical errors. But the sad part of the book was that she turned society against industry. She turned society against capitalism. She presented nature and the earth as totally pristine, never responsible for anything bad. Everything bad lay at the hands of mankind. All chemicals manufactured by man were seen to cause uh, problems in the environment. Uh, her book led to our animal testing, and really it led to the, to the first and terrible mathematical models that you may not be aware of, but it's an area that I have worked in, the rodent bioassay. From her book and the testing of the environmental chemicals she decried, we decided that uh, rodents were in fact little people and that what you did to a rodent and how that rodent reacted was the same as man and this was done through a mathematical model. We would test chemicals on, on rodents and I, I won't go into how uh, poor the tests were run, how the, the population of rodents we used were uh, all inbred, if not cloned. I always, uh, I, with Lord Monken here, I don't, maybe don't want to say this, but there was a relationship between the population of rodents that were attested to the royal family. Uh, sometimes in Ohio I use West Virginia, but you, you get the point. But whatever the, the chemistry the data came out of the rodents, it was passed through a mathematical equation, a mathematical model that linked the rodents to man, and, and uh, the science just got worse and worse. As a result, has been pointed out earlier, we have not had DDT in the last 40-some years uh, to eradicate malaria, uh, a disease that was almost gone in 19. 71 and now a couple million people uh, die annually as a result of our inability uh, to use probably the most important uh, chemical on earth. So these things uh, link up uh, to where we are. Then we come to public ignorance. Uh, I had a wonderful chat with Lord Christopher Monckton at uh, breakfast and he will again energize us with the final talk uh, at lunch today. And the talk we had was about education and the in incredible uh, decline of the general education of the public. And if that is a, a general decline of education uh, in science, uh, it is truly deplorable. Virtually everybody uh, growing up learns who William Shakespeare is but how many people uh, know what the second law of thermodynamics is? Our, our, our recognition of science is deplorable. Uh, the Pew uh, Institute, not a, a group that I uh, 
give much uh, credence or, or stock to, however, does some interesting surveys. And they did a survey of uh, a very large group of the American public. And they found that more than 50% of our public uh, had wrong answers to the following three questions. One, and this is fascinating, and uh, you can try it on your families and you'll find that they will not rank any better, uh, sadly. Uh, how long does it take the Earth to rotate around the sun? Uh, I know that's weird, but I've asked that question of an awful lot of uh, re reasonably smart people. And the answers come back, uh, does the Earth rotate around the sun? Uh, 24 hours is a common answer. Uh, more than half the people could not uh, recognize that it, of course, was the 365-day year. Uh, the next question they asked was a, a, a true or false question. True or false? Men and dinosaurs coexisted. More than half got that one right, wrong. And, and maybe the saddest, uh, and from an observational standpoint, the third question was, uh, can you give a, a reasonable estimate of what percentage of our planet uh, is covered by water versus uh, land? And uh, more than half were unable to get somewhere in the area of three quarters or seven eighths or two thirds, which would be considered correct uh, answers. So we're faced with, a, with an amazing disparity of knowledge. Uh, another survey showed that 70% of the public do believe that we're uh, facing an imminent uh, loss of available oil, that we are almost running out of oil. And there is an arguable question because you grow up you know, thinking that. My own opinion is that we probably good with petroleum for another couple hundred years and probably coal for uh, a thousand years. But uh, the forces of evil have absolutely convinced the public that we are uh, running out of fossil fuel. You heard uh, Pat Michaels uh, showed a chart of uh, where we would be if we reduce our carbon by 83% by uh, 2050, which is the, uh, what the president wants and uh, what the new uh, cap and trade bill would require. And it uh, brings us back uh, to life in 1867. Uh, I'll get back to that because I think it's an incredibly uh, important point that needs to be made uh, and needs to be advertised. Now, you take this uh, amazing ignorance of, uh, of science and you, uh, you take entities of the population that have a, a horse in the race and they pound this ignorance. Uh, on Wall Street, I'm a great fan of capitalism, but I think that too many capitalists are, in fact, greedy pigs, as they've always been painted by uh, the socialists. And uh, on Wall Street, uh, cap and trade would be the greatest uh, thing that ever happened. Uh, I do a lot of work in agriculture, and uh, I deal with uh, commodities like corn and soy and, and wheat and sorghum. Wow, would, would that trade be dwarfed by trade in uh, carbon dioxide and the Wall Street people know it. Uh, it has given me great joy uh, to see all the trouble that Goldman Sachs has found themselves in of late because they, they lead the push uh, for cap and trade. Uh, one great success, kind of a little aside, that my wife and I had uh, shortly after the conference last May uh, I was asked by some uh, unknown benefactor uh, to the Heartland Institute to go to Australia and uh, lecture on uh, uh, their cap and trade bill, which was called, uh, had, a, had a different name there, ETS uh, was the name of the bill. And we lectured across uh, Australia, gave 19 talks in a little over uh, two weeks, uh, became uh, infamous. I was on every radio station and every television station, not kindly treated, I might uh, add, but that delighted me no end. And uh, as I literally stepped on the plane to leave uh, uh, Australia, uh, they defeated the cap and trade uh, bill there. But Uh, 
it, it's, gotten, it's gotten even better because uh, they were going to re-bring the bill up again in November. It lost again, and uh, now Mr. Rudd has absolutely tabled further debate uh, for, uh, for three years. So uh, we really have one for the time being. But I bring Australia up regard, because of Goldman Sachs. When I got to Australia, I found out the leader of the conservative party that was battling Mr. Rudd on this, uh, uh, their cap and trade bill was the former president of Goldman Sachs in Australia. I said, there's something wrong here, something about the fox and the hen house or something like that. And uh, I made this point and happily, uh, within weeks after I left, they threw him out and a wonderful young politician by the name of Tony Abbott took over. Uh, Australia's, yes. <laughs> Australia's success is indicative of what I want uh, you to do uh, as, I, as I now move into uh, exactly what you can do. Australia's success was a grassroots effort. Really fascinating uh, how they went about it. And I made the mistake, or at least it was a mistake in my wife's mind, they asked me how often I'd be willing to speak in Australia. I said, if you can get me an audience at breakfast, lunch, and dinner, or morning, noon, and night, I will speak all day long. And of course, I knew they couldn't possibly do that, and my wife knew she'd have many days to explore Australia. Well, uh, lo and behold, they sent out notices to everybody in Australia that was willing to help and uh, were able to keep me busy morning, noon, and night. Uh, and as a matter of fact, a lot of them didn't have meals. Uh, we figured out we missed eight major meals while we're in Australia talking. And they would just uh, find volunteers who would put a handbill on a, a telephone pole, put a, an ad in a newspaper, uh, hire a gymnasium, and invite people uh, to come and hear me talk. And, and it was fabulous. They really got everybody involved. They got the, the news media involved. Uh, we need that kind of a of a grassroots uh, issue. Now, beginning with the third part of my, my talk and moving toward the conclusion, in my paper, I explain that the very big things that we need to do, you've already heard. We need to make all data by all scientists promoting anthropogenic global warming to be made public. Uh, it is absurd. I mean, the greatest email that we should never, ever forget is the one Patrick Michael showed of uh, Phil Jones, or no, I think it was Michael Mann to Phil Jones, or one of the, I think it was Michael Jones to Phil, Michael Mann to Phil Jones, saying, I've worked 25 years on this data. Why would I give it to them when they want to prove me wrong? That is what science is about. Nobody should be allowed to publish a paper without making the data instantly available on the internet, which is a fairly uh, easy, easy thing to do. So all of you, to the extent that you are capable, need to be promoting that cause to expose data. In, in the mathematical models, which nobody understands except the modelers, we need to show the source codes. The public needs to know what's in the model. I mean, if they saw the small number of variables in the model and understand that, if, as Willie Soon has told us, if, if you use all the variables in, with regard to effects of climate, there isn't a computer on the planet that could handle it. And if there were, it would take decades, if not centuries, to come out with an answer. The public needs to understand what these models are in a simplistic way. The grant process needs to be transparent. It is not. We don't know how one uh, professor or academic or researcher is chosen over another. It needs to be transparent. I mean, these are the, the three areas at the highest level that needs to be done. But you can do a little bit more. Uh, and and, and it, it's a small thing. But I think all of you can be involved. You can begin teaching young people and those around you that science is based on evidence, on, on data. All they have 
are models that are just mental constructs of how they think the, the world works. And as you've heard over and over again, these models can be tweaked to give you uh, any answer you, you want. Uh, they have some semblance of reality, and as you've been told by other speakers, they, they are useful. Models are useful. They, they give you an idea of, of what are the important issues, what are the important variables. They are useful. But what I'm imploring you to do is to look on the back of my professional card and each and every one of you to do one of two things if you care enough about global warming, if you care enough about our side of the issue, if you care about personal freedom, if you care about our way of life, that you all create a professional card, whether you're a scientist or a doctor, a lawyer, a candlestick maker, everybody ought to have a card. And on the back of that card, if this is an issue you care enough about, write some educational facts that you can give away to everybody. I, you all have my card. I have given away tens of thousands of them. If you are too new age and you don't care about the written word or paper or cards and your entire life is on a Blackberry, a computer, or an email, down the bottom of your email, where you list whatever your contact information is, create your own phrase about global warming. Heartland has a great big poster uh, somewhere outside of this room that lists eight little facts about, you know, global warming is not harmful and, and uh, why man is not uh, responsible. You can use mine, use any of mine, use anything, but have a little passion. I, I have to, I have great respect for Steve McIntyre, and I think his tremendous. And, and I have great respect, of course, for, for Harrison Ford, for, excuse me, Harrison. <laughs> no, I don't, actually. For Harrison Schmidt, and we had that debate uh, a Sunday night on passion versus less passion. Uh, both men, uh, are very effective in what they do. But uh, if you have enough passion or enough caring to be willing to share your own uh, opinions, create a professional card with a message. Give it away. I give it away to people in elevators. I go into a supermarket and buy dog food and make friends on the dog food aisle and talk a little uh, global warming on the, on the way. And, and people find it very pleasant and uh, very amusing. And as I said, uh, if you don't want to go the card route, write something on your emails. Everyone in this room in the next number of months could impact two or three dozen people. Open their eyes to what is going on. Uh, and in that way, I think we can indeed uh, win. We've come a long way. We have further to go. Uh, we toasted our success thus far. We will get to the critical point where 80% of the public that is, doesn't have a horse in the race, is just misinformed, can come to our side. Uh, I think at that point, the news media will begin telling the truth rather than the alarming stories they tell. And I think we can turn our government uh, and your governments around. Thank you all very, very much.